Our first speaker today is Professor Sunil Mukhi, presently at ISAR Pune. Professor Mukhi is a world-renowned scientist, specializes in the research in string theory and quantum field theory. He did his PhD in State University of New York at Stony Brook and spent a few years at ICTP 3S as a postdoctoral fellow. He was a faculty member at TIFR from 1985 till 2012, and thereafter he continues at ISAR Pune. He has many accolades and achievements to his credit. I wouldn't go into all of it. He is a recipient of prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, is a fellow of Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, and the World Academy of Sciences. I would like to mention a few of his administrative roles, which are relevant to today's program. He was the Dean of Graduate Studies in TIFR, in fact, the first Dean of Graduate Studies in TIFR. He was Dean of Student Activities in ISAR Pune. He is Chair of Academic Ethics Committee in TIFR and continues to be, uh, continues the same role at ISAR also. He also works for promoting gender harmony. We are indeed fortunate to get guidance from Professor Mukhi about scientific writing skills and ethics in research. Over to you, Professor Sundar Mukhi. Thank you so much, Vandana. Uh, and uh, it's very nice to be with everyone. So uh, uh, <clears throat> welcome, and I'll try to keep this within time, though I don't guarantee it. Uh, I'll now share my screen. Uh, there, oh, oops. Yes, I hope that's good. Yes. Okay, uh, so with that, I'll start. So um, yeah, um, I'll talk, uh, I'll give a very brief survey uh, about ethics in research. Uh, actually, that's the main focus. And the last part of it, you'll see that some aspects of scientific writing will come in. So uh, I'm trying to be perfectly general from the beginning. So let's say a few words about ethics itself, uh, which is a very big subject. Ethics is the study of right action. This is important. Why? To have a just and fair system. We often keep trying to explain to students why ethics is important. And in their minds, it's important because the teacher says so, or because they get in trouble for not following ethical procedures. But that's not the underlying reason. It's not a rule made up by somebody just for their own fun. It's important in order to have a just and fair system. This is something everyone should keep in mind. Now, people often confuse ethics with law. Uh, there's a certain difference, there's certain similarity also. Law is defined country to country. So what is legal one side of a border, it can be illegal on the other side. But ethics is something a little more broad and it's a little more vaguely defined. Uh, you don't get necessarily arrested for violating ethics. You can get in other kinds of trouble. Uh, but it's not norm. ethics is not normally implemented by force, by jail sentence and so on, the way law is implemented. Instead, ethical guidelines are supposed to grow from within. It's more, you should think of it more like a kind of a plant or a, or a living organism <clears throat> of which we are all a part. If ethics grows in each of us, then it grows like a tree or like a plant in our institution, in our home, uh, in all the places where we function. And in particular, they are implemented within each profession and each community in its unique way. Now, personal honesty is the key uh, about ethics, is the key for ethics. And uh, I'd like to just make, uh, show you a few statements, which probably you have made to yourself and probably I have made to myself at some time or other when we were in school or college. Uh, everyone does it, so it must be okay. Uh, if I can get away with it, then it's okay. I'll only cheat once, so it's okay. Other people were unfair to me, so now I will also be unfair to other people. This is a very, uh, a very effective uh, argument, but it's also uh, not really uh, correct. And uh, it's very important that none of these is a legitimate argument uh, to violate ethical principles. But let's be frank, it sounds familiar. If we are human beings, probably we have fallen into this way of thinking at some time or other. Here's a practical, one practical way to think about ethics. Do towards others as you would like them to do towards you. 
okay so why when we are standing in a queue why we don't jump to the front because we don't also want people behind us to jump to the front we assume that the queue is a system which takes each of us uh, in a just and fair way according to the time when we arrived over there and we don't want others cheating that system therefore we shouldn't also cheat that system an ideal system is when everyone agrees to respect it okay now here is an example i like to give students and i i must say it works very well uh in now you are not students but i think uh, you may want to you you may need to use these arguments so i'm giving them to you supposing one of our family members is going to have a critical surgery one day before the surgery we meet the batchmate of the surgeon who is going to perform that surgery and he says oh yeah i know the surgeon who is going to operate on your uh, relative that surgeon was found cheating in those days when uh, you know when we did surgery exam together he cheated how now that person's skill that surgeon's skill will decide whether your relative lives or dies how will you feel about the news of their cheating would it be the same as you will feel if one of your friends says oh you know i copied in the exam and you say chalta hai let it go would you feel that way about this surgeon i think you would not <coughs> how will it affect your view about cheating in an exam how will it affect your view about cheating in research these are the ways to think to realize that everything we do either has to be ethical or we are in a system where everything will be unethical and we will suffer as much as we make other people suffer it works in both directions now here is another uh, argument and i think this is a very good one for researchers especially young researchers like the audience here if your institute or your country has a bad reputation for ethics how will it affect your future okay for you who is going to publish your papers if they come from a country which is badly considered as far as ethics goes okay actually let's not mince words india is badly considered as far as ethics goes and it will affect uh your publications and your future uh, unfortunately it may not affect in a fair way that is it may not be you who is unethical it may be the country or it may be the institute or it may be the image that is out there but whatever it is it's going to happen like this it's worth keeping that in mind okay now let's get into a, a few details about academic ethics this is a statement about behavior and standards of a particular community which is the academic community to which we all belong and one place where ethical standards are set is our institution so each academic institution will have its own ethical code or principles as well as its own practice now these not may not be the same we may have some very lofty uh principles of ethics but they may not be followed at all unfortunately that is the case today in a lot of places in our country as well as in other countries so the principles can be a written document but the practice is what you can see in the actions of the whole community okay and the practice becomes something that people talk about or people discuss and which uh, creates an image of your institute now journals where we publish also set at ethical standards it took them some time so at one time journals were not bothered with this but in the last 20 to 25 years most journals have woken up and put an ethics statement on their website and if a paper doesn't follow those standards it can be rejected or retracted by the journal and i'll be talking about this very paper which you see over here in a moment now for the next few slides i will quote parts of the icer pune guidelines on scientific values the reason uh, i use this document is that i helped to make it but also it's largely taken from the tifr guidelines on scientific values uh, and both of these i think are good templates uh, for any institution to make their own guidelines they may tweak it they may change it but every institute should have its own written guidelines and this document of icer pune you can find on our web page and it's about 7 or 8 pages long not very long i'm going to go through just some very uh, brief uh, quotes from this 
so the first few quotes apply to students well they are not the first few in the in the guidelines but i the first few that i'm going to discuss here uh, students are expected to dedicate themselves to each course with complete honesty as well as a sincere effort to participate and learn assignments test exams etc must be carried out strictly in accordance with provided guidelines attempting to use any unauthorized materials or information or copying or stealing from another student is ethically unacceptable uh, now i must tell you that constantly i find iser students uh, doing things like this i say that no calculators are allowed in the exam they still use a calculator and they say we used a calculator somewhere there's no <clears throat> understanding that the guidelines which are provided must be followed strictly okay it's a very strange weakness because these are not people intending to cheat necessarily but they don't quite understand that a guideline is not something you can fool around with it's the guideline okay so that's for students um uh, safety uh, there's a short section on safety research activity must not endanger other people or the environment in any way this can be the subject of a much longer discussion now here is something very important and this has to do more with uh, with you with faculty uh, in both independent and collaborative research every effort must be made to ensure that data are collected and computations performed with complete honesty fabrication falsification or improper manipulation of data are highly unethical and must not be resorted to and it's the researcher's own duty to find out what methods of handling processing and storing data are acceptable or not in their field now we constantly see examples where researchers feel that some manipulation of the data is okay uh, because it didn't affect the main results of the paper you know this sentence is nonsense please don't try to use it if you ever get in trouble the correctness and originality of a research publication can be questioned even long after publication we often hear that people have lost their original data 20 years later well too bad these are times in which if you lose your data and if there is evidence of manipulation your paper will be retracted by the journal and you'll have to face inquiries so it's better to keep the data very carefully now there's a very classic case of a smart researcher called shun in bell labs he admitted to falsifying some data and stated that he did so to show more convincing evidence for behavior that he observed you know and something there's something really deeply sad about this sentence you can't falsify data to show more convincing evidence it's either the evidence is there or it's not there you can't make it up more recently a lot of uh, there's been a lot of buzz in the press because this website pubpeer.com unearths a large number of cases of manipulation of typically of manipulation of images now we don't need to believe pubpeer.com it is simply a pointer it's an anonymous thing so people may point out something wrong with your work but once it's pointed out other people can independently verify if you cheated or not okay and it's a growing problem because many cases in pub peer when they are investigated turn out to be true which means that the person really did cheat and this is very serious this is not acceptable it leads to a lot of trouble but it's very very common and sadly in india it's very very common okay <clears throat> now all individuals participating in a research project are responsible for their own actions and should make sure these are consistent with and uphold high ethical standards now uh, these uh, statements apply to faculty for example very clearly but there are extra statements which are for younger researchers including students and the reason i'll explain to you it's not that they have to be more careful but they have to understand that they have their own obligations even as junior partners in research okay unethical behavior on their part cannot be justified by saying that they were following a mentor's instructions this is very important you cheat somewhere because your mentor tells you to then you get caught then you say no no but my mentor told me sorry this is your responsibility it's your research you are the one going to get the job or the promotion for the research 
and you need to follow ethical uh, standards right from the beginning. Okay. Now, here is something very important, which in recent years has worked its way into ethics documents because it is an aspect of ethics. People feel that the full and equal participation of women, although it's a very good, uh, uh, noble goal, people tried to say that, well, this should be a separate discussion on gender, but actually it turns out that gender discussions, the bias which makes it difficult for women to function in academia and for uh, more generally for various kinds of minority groups or uh, underprivileged groups to participate uh, are all unethical and they all lead to a less ethical academic environment. So this sentence is extremely important. Now, because of shortage of time, I think I should move on to my last section. So I have about seven or eight minutes, I think. Um, and I want to stress that although we want to aim for full and equal participation of women in science, it's not a reality in any country and certainly not in this country, although incremental small progress is being made even as we speak. Research actually, sociological research has shown that women academics face two kinds of uh, difficulty. One is that they are often overlooked. They are not listened to, they're not taken seriously, they're not put to chair committees, etc. Uh, they're not considered easily for promotion. At the same time, they also have to watch out for sexual harassment. So there's sexual harassment and gender bias. These are not the same. These are two problems. And when the same person is encountered, encountering them, it can make it very difficult for them to function. More generally, one should avoid discrimination against people of different ethnicities, religions, castes, socioeconomic strata, backgrounds, gender identities, and sexual orientations. All of these are important. Okay, so now I'll come to publication, and I think scientific writing was one of the topics in my uh, title that was given to me. So let's talk about publication. So, uh, one has to be careful not to write too many things about publication, which don't apply equally across different fields. One thing you may know as physicists, that the way publications are considered in condensed matter physics, in material science, in mathematical physics, in particle physics, in nuclear physics, is quite different. And we must respect that. More generally, if you are in a bigger world where you have also to deal with departments of chemistry, biology, mathematics, you'll find that all of them have different approaches. We must respect that diversity. But a few general things can be said. <clears throat> One is all listed authors of a publication should have contributed significantly, but we don't judge for other people what is considered significant. It is wrong to exclude from authorship anyone who deserves to be an author. Now, this is a very tricky one because there can be different opinions. And we have seen cases where somebody thought they deserve to be an author. Somebody else didn't think they deserve to be an author. And it leads to fights. That's unfortunate, but it has to be sorted. And it needs to be done in a reasonably open and transparent way. It's inappropriate to offer authorship to someone who has not made any significant contribution. Okay, so it's not up to you to go to somebody and say, I have put your name on my paper. You can't just do that. There's an ethical consideration. It's not yours to offer authorship where that person doesn't deserve authorship. You can't offer it like a present to get points with some senior person. But as I said, this all varies from subject to subject and one has to be sensitive about differences. Okay, now it's also important to distinguish between honest mistakes and misconduct. So here's a quote from an article. Many retractions are straightforward and honorable. For example, this person retracted a paper in FizRev letters where he found that a key part of the analysis had been performed incorrectly. His thoroughness and speed retracting the paper in four months was singled out for praise on this website, which looks at retracted papers. So this is an article in Science uh, in, in Nature, actually, uh, on science publishing and retractions. So again, one has to be careful. You can have your work retracted for misconduct, but it could also be retracted just for an honest mistake. In one case, the person may need punishment. In the other case, they don't need punishment. Okay. 
So the last topic, plagiarism. A crucial issue in writing of reports, articles, term papers, and research papers. What is the definition? It's the practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. It can involve unattributed lifting of textual material or scientific ideas or actual research results. It can also involve incorporation of some ideas or results of other researchers without proper attribution. So attribution is the act when I say this idea came from so-and-so, from this person's paper, or this result that I'm using came from someone's paper. <clears throat> now, there are rare cases, but there was one very famous one in India that I like to talk about because I had something to do with, uh, with, with set, getting it settled, uh, was a case of total plagiarism by the vice chancellor of a university in 2002. So here is a paper from Stanford, the title uh, by Renata Kalosh, and below is a paper of Joshi and Rajput from Kumau University, and Rajput at the time was the VC. Now, here's a quote from the Kalosh paper, which is six years earlier. You may not be expert in this field of supersymmetry and dionic black holes, that doesn't matter. Look at what these people wrote. And if you see, there are many giveaways. One could have guessed, one could have guessed hmm, that the black holes of n equals two theory, that black holes of the n equals two theory, one the has moved from somewhere to somewhere else. But you can see that these are the same sentence. Very often people say, no, no, it's not plagiarism. After all, when you're expressing a scientific fact, you can only say it one way. Not true. Plagiarism stands out by the copying of words in a continuous pattern. Now, there were same equations in both papers. Again, you may justify saying, well, if they're going to use the same equation, the same result, then it's okay. But actually, the second paper never cited the first one. And finally, in the conclusions, the second set of authors gave up trying to even hide their cheating. This is verbatim. They just literally cut pasted an entire conclusions of a paper in their paper. And you can see that every word and every line is the same. Well, the paper now shows as follows. There's an apology from the journal. They apologized to the first or the previous author. The journal should have never accepted it. Obviously, some referee was careless. And uh, basically, the journal is saying that um, apart from some well-known material, the first half of uh, the text of the paper has been copied literally. And Europhysics Letters apologizes to Professor Kalosh. Okay, if you download the paper today, it's still there. It just shows retracted. Okay, these things are not removed from the website, they stay on the website. And here is the news item in 2003, where a committee set up by, uh, actually it was originated by the president, Sri APJ Abdul Kalam, who heard about this case and was very concerned. And this person was asked to step down. Now, that's not a very common problem. That kind of plagiarism is not as common as the kind that people do without realizing that it's wrong. So here is an example of a case that I had to deal with at some point. Authors copied and pasted one full page of material from an older paper by different authors. They did refer to that older paper, but only at the start of their paper. They didn't, they didn't clearly indicate that they have copied one out of four pages of their paper from that original paper. Their main scientific results are not stolen from the paper. They have only stolen background information, but they have cut pasted it or they have copy pasted it. And this lack of paraphrase or attribution made it plagiarism and the authors had to correct it. So here I have put side by side the text. The left is original, the right is the second paper. And you can again see that everything, that many things are word for word copied and that this is not something that you would do when just reviewing some previous material. This is not acceptable. Okay. Now, remember, the use of someone else's work in your own is not by itself unethical. You can use someone else's results with proper attribution. Or you can paraphrase it, but then you have to learn how to paraphrase. So in the last two minutes of the talk, 
uh vandana am i over time or i hope i have two minutes no, that's two all minutes is okay time. you can oh, take a couple of minutes yeah and i have two slides i think yeah, yeah. good so now i'm going to run you through an example uh, of of course my hero steven weinberg and uh, steven weinberg this is the paragraph this paragraph in quotes is the opening uh, two sentences of his very famous paper that got him a nobel prize for the standard model of particle physics okay so i have given a tick mark that means this way of incorporating his work in your work is okay as steven weinberg observed and then you open quote and you put everything he has said there two sentences and close quote you can't really quote more than two sentences at a time of somebody but you can do two sentences one or two like this but you have another option you can also not put quotes and you can say that steven weinberg has pointed out that since leptons interact only with photons and with intermediate vector bosons it is natural to unite the latter into a multiple gauge fields now some words are common but it's not a literal quote so it doesn't need quotation marks and it's a valid way to refer to that person's work there's also a possible paraphrase where you don't necessarily have to mention his reference right there but somewhere it should be acknowledged here you are stating well known facts photons and spin one bosons mediate the electromagnetic and weak forces and leptons couple to them hence it is tempting to speculate that bosons form an irreducible multiplet under gauge symmetry okay but you there you are not using phrase like what could be more natural see what could be more natural is a rhetorical way it's a flowery way to talk which was used by weinberg you can't use it and pretend that it's your words okay as long as you confine yourself to the bare facts in your own words then it's a proper paraphrase now let me show you some improper uh, <clears throat> ways of uh using the same so for comparison i have kept the direct quote but here is an unattributed quote this is not okay in your paper Left, the same words basically exactly the same words as weinberg but you have not said as steven weinberg observed and you have not put quotation marks this is not okay this is plagiarism okay now here is another one you have tried to paraphrase but what have you done you have just kept his words and played around with a few words in between for example leptons then you opened a bracket and wrote which are the leptons okay but otherwise it's his sentence interact only with photons and with you have dropped one the here and there this is unacceptable paraphrase you are basically copying his work his words and then putting a few words here and there to hide your copying this is not okay so these are things there's a lot of material on the internet and these are things that uh, one must learn and as a researcher it's your own duty to learn them okay resources are available but one has to spend the time uh so okay so this is yeah this is a summary of these observations and the final thing if you want to paraphrase you should read and understand the material then put it away don't pin it next to your screen and then express the idea in your own words not in memorized words of that person so that's all i have to say thank you very much i'm happy to answer questions thank you sunil for a very comprehensive introduction and uh, covering uh, ethics and uh, it's also really important that you included the discrimination uh, based on it is also part of ethics i think as a concept that is really important to get through we have 5 uh, minutes so we can take questions if there are i don't see anything typed in as yet but i guess if somebody wants to even raise the hands that's possible or maybe people type in is five is better if they do okay there is a raised hand yes jagnasani please go ahead hi ma'am uh, hello uh, dr prasam uh, mukhi that was really nice to hear from you uh, in fact i heard so much about you over the years um just a quick question here so when we are uh, writing a review paper suppose we have to quote uh, a table uh, of data or a figure from some paper what is the right way to put it yeah so when it comes to quoting a, so a table or a figure you know the general rule as that i understand is that if it's a figure and you make the figure that means literally you or your friend or your staff or somebody in your lab 
uh, draws the figure using some software or draws it by hand. Uh, you're allowed to use, uh, of course, your own figures, uh, even if they are similar to figures which are in other papers. But if you want to actually paste the figure from another paper, in principle, you need the permission of the author or whoever owns the copyright of that paper. Now, uh, what journals do is they ask you to obtain the copyright permission. And most of the time, you don't have to pay for it. To use your figure, is it okay? That person will write back if they're reasonable and say yes. But if they don't want to be reasonable, you need to find another way out. Most, most often, people are cooperative about these things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you can you so also much. use a, a table, for example, and you can just quote that paper for the table. That's like a quote from the. You don't have to get permission to use everything from another person. You have to make sure that what you use is limited in quantity. If you use extensively, you will get in trouble. If you use limited amount, in the worst case, somebody will write to you saying, no, no, you can't use that. Then you say, sorry, remove it and revise your paper and you're, you're done. Okay. Uh, because like when tables are given, sometimes those, those are small tables. So probably we can put a line up front saying that like legal disclaimer kind of thing that, okay, we are taking it from this paper for this particular purpose. Yes. Yes. Uh, but when the papers are like, the tables are really long, like one or two pages. So that's when it's kind of confusing. Like what should we do? No. Then it's confusing and then usually, you know, what I advise people is find out in your field what is acceptable. For example, your PhD guide, your senior faculty, somebody exactly in your field. Okay, Because different fields approach these things in different ways. As you may know, in biology, you're not even allowed to post a preprint uh, in some cases without first getting the journal's permission. In physics, you'll laugh at that idea. Every physics paper is posted as a preprint and we don't think journal has any right to tell us what to do with our preprints. Hmm. So it varies from field to field. It, it depends a lot how much money is involved. So because not so much money is involved in physics compared with biology, uh, we are much less uh, high strung about these problems. And I have one more question. Okay, uh, and then we we'll come back to you. We will should use chance to other if the time permits. We'll ask. Otherwise, you type your question. We'll take the. Sure, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's the right forum. So please excuse me if it is not in the. Like, no, no, it doesn't matter. Type your question. Hemal sure. Kumar has a another uh, has a question. So thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a quick question regarding this uh, the storage of data. You mentioned like somewhere like, I know talk like. Maybe 20 years is also not sufficient. So of course, at uh, some point it becomes impractical to keep storing this data. So what's a typical like suggestion you have regarding that? Store it. I mean, you have hard, you buy an external hard disk with any grant which you have or with your own money and store it. I mean, a few TB should be enough to store it, at least your essential data. I know that some people's data is uh, much more than TB. But, uh, you know, if you're in a collaboration like CERN or something, then CERN will store the data or you store the data on their server. But if you're a material scientist or you're some kind of a desktop scientist or you're a theorist, store your, store your data on a disk, forget about it, but make sure it's there somewhere in your desk drawer in case of problem. Be prepared for problems with every single paper you write. That's my advice. Okay. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Okay, uh, yeah, Shobhan, Shobhan Paul, please go ahead. Yeah, so hi, uh, that was very nice talk. And I just have a, a comment kind of a thing to pass. So regarding this uh, data thing, so the popular culture is, today's culture is open data. So how is the culture in India though? So uh, we have a practice, so previous affiliation where I had was, there is an open repository and the moment we take our data, we put our data there. So of course, anyone can get back to us. We give them the chance to see our raw data and look and judge for themselves if it is correct or not. So how is the culture in India as a, as a, you know, many institutes, do we have this kind of, we store all our data, all experimental data in one common repository. And then if someone, it belongs to the property of the institute though, not ours, the place where we work, it's the property of the institute. And whenever uh, other people can come, uh, they can basically have a claim for looking at the data. So we are not supposed to take the data out. It's the property of the Institute. Though. 
I mean, we can yeah, keep. So I can't answer that, but Vandana and Bedang are two experimentalists who can definitely answer it. Yeah. So the data is definitely the property of the institute. The logbooks are also property of institute. But uh, the common repository, so some of the, it's again different rules, each collaboration has how they store. But I think there is a need to get more transparency now and which is getting uh, uh, sort of surfacing with certain events that it has to, you have to keep it and you have to do. But many journals these days ask you to submit raw data. Yeah, and I know this for biology. I also know this for nuclear physics that they ask you to provide whatever and uh, the, the things which are not just the plots. So that that's, I think, is coming in. Yeah. Vedang, you want to add something? No, no, yeah, that is about, we need to, that's a good question, actually. We need to see yeah, how we need this to, is to India be needs to get a little more updated on that, yeah. Okay, I think it's an exciting discussion and perhaps we can go on, but uh, unfortunately, the time is also advancing. So let me thank uh, Professor Sunil Mukhi for really a very comprehensive talk. And I uh, would ask you people to type questions if they're, I'm sure he will answer things more. Yeah, there are some and I'll type my answer in the chat. All right, good. So thank you.